going back. In summary, proxy with HTTP. Using HTTP, our data is not encrypted. So we generally would like to use HTTPS. With a proxy and just HTTP, we must trust the proxy. The proxy can read our data, as can others. But if we use a proxy and HTTPS, the others cannot read our data, the firewall cannot, but we still must trust the proxy and the proxy can read your data because the proxy needs a way to be able to decrypt the data to see the destination server address. And that's a, a key difference with a VPN server. Here the proxy can read the data. So if you're accessing your bank website via the web proxy, you may assume that the proxy knows your username and password and knows all your account information because Normally, for a web proxy to work, the proxy requires the ability to decrypt the data. So that's not a good idea. But with a VPN and HTTPS, the data is encrypted on your computer using HTTPS, and it's not decrypted until it gets to the final server. So the VPN cannot read your data. But we still must trust the VPN not to reveal who's communicating. Before we look at the, the last technique, the server cannot identify you. Well, we say that because the addresses. The server receives a packet, the source is V, is not you. But how else can the server identify you? How does a web server know it's you that's accessing it? How does Facebook know it's you that's accessing it? Based upon your IP address? Based upon some session which comes from what? You logging in. All right. So if you log into a website and you supply the, your username and password, of course the website knows it's you. So when we assume or say here the server cannot identify you, I mean they cannot identify you by the source IP address. But they may identify you via other means. If there's a login for that website, of course they can identify you. Or if, even if there's not a login, but there's some other information that the web server observes, cookies uh, and some tracking of your behavior based upon past access, they may still be able to identify you. So it's just with respect to the address. Let's see the last technique which will try to provide all security features and we'll see how it does that and the last technique is called TOR T-O-R or the onion router it uses onion routing what's an onion look like round and if you open it up an onion you cry, and often why? You, you peel off the layers. So there's usually an outer layer on an onion, and then you peel off an inner layer, and then another layer, and, and so on. So the concept of an onion, or the concept of the name of onion routing, is that we'll send a packet, which will be encrypted multiple times, and as we send via multiple VPN servers, each one will peel off a layer, will unencrypt, and send the inner part to the next one, which will peel off another layer and keep going until it gets to the destination. So the name comes from this concept of peeling off layers, which is, in our context, decrypting the packet and sending what's inside, taking out the outer header and sending what's inside. Tor was designed for anonymous communications in the public internet. And the way that it works is that computers in the internet, whether it's your home computer or a special server, it can be any computer that runs the Tor software, act as relay nodes. And the Tor relays are really like VPN servers. But in Tor, instead of using one VPN server, we'll see we'll use multiple VPN servers. And what your computer does, your source computer, is that when you want to access a website, the Tor software on your computer selects some relays to send via. And it has some approaches for doing that. 
and they will send to a special Tor node called an exit node. And then that exit node will send the data using the normal internet without using Tor. We'll see that in a picture. Between the nodes, from your computer to the first Tor relay to the next Tor relay, they use encryption, SSL in particular. There's some key exchange so that they can uh, decrypt correctly. What else? We'll see this come up when, with our example, the last one. So let's see how it works and then look at the advantages or the issues. Here's our client. You want to talk to the server S, some normal website. In the internet, there are some Tor relays. Think of them as some routers in the internet, but they in fact can be any computing device that runs the Tor software. And in my picture, I've identified T1, T2, and T3 as Tor relay nodes. And E is a special Tor node called an exit node. So there, there are four other computers we're going to send via in this case. So how does it work? And this is the as simplest as I can give explanation of Tor. You choose. So your computer runs some Tor software. And one thing it will do is choose a set of relays to send via and an exit node. So my computer has chosen T1, 2, 3, and E. I have a HTTP packet to send. Not HTTPS yet, just HTTP. I take that original HTTP packet and I set so I take the data, I encrypt that, and I attach a header that says the destination will be E. And then I encrypt all of that. And this is hard to show on this picture. We may draw it again. We will encrypt all of this packet with a different key and say the destination is T3, and then encrypt all of that again, and attach the outer header, T2, have that all encrypted again, and then the final outer header, source is U, destination is T1. Let's try and draw that as we go. So you can see the steps. What have we got? We have, and you can use your same picture, we'll draw it on top. We have T1 here, T2, T3, and the exit node. I create a packet, and it's going to be big. Uh, there's the original data, the HTTP request, and some header identifying E. And that is all encrypted. With a key, let's get it correct. Actually, we can have the data encrypted with a key known by E. And then all of that is encrypted with a key known by T3. We attach another header. identifying T3.
and that's encrypted with a key known by T2. And there's the header to T2. And all of that is encrypted with a key known by T1. And then there's the outer header. Source is U. Destination T1. That's the packets on the slide, but I've sh also shown the keys, and we'll see how that works. So you can draw the keys on the slide to make it clear. So this is the original packet sent by you. Who do you send it to? Who gets this packet? T1, all right? T1 is the first relay node. And can T1 decrypt this packet? Well, let's look. Let's say we throw away the header, we peel off a layer. This is our onion. T1 receives this packet. Let's get rid of the header. What have we got left? We've got something encrypted. Encrypted with which key? A key which I denote KT1, meaning a key that's known by both U and T1. Only by that pair. So yes, T1 receives this, removes the header, peels off a layer, and decrypts the contents. What do they see? They see the destination, so when I write the address T2 here, I mean the destination of the next packet is T2. So T1 sees, ah, I need to send this onion to T2. Can T1 see the data? The data is encrypted, in fact, multiple times. It's encrypted, the inner part now is encrypted with a key known by T2, not T1. So what does T1 send on to T2? Across this, and I, I won't squeeze everything in, but across this link from T1 to T2, there's the data, E, T3, and the source is T1 and the destination T2. When I write T2 here, I mean the destination is T2. And what's encrypted? Well, the header is no longer encrypted. From T3 through to the data is encrypted, this part with KT2 here. That's that part. So this is this, the onion being sent from T1 to T2. What happened? The relay node T1 received the first one. They could decrypt the inner part. So they remove the header. They peel off a layer of the onion. Decrypt the inner part and realize, ah, I need to send this to T2. That's what the header indicates. So now T1 sends this onion to T2. T2 receives this. Can T2 decrypt? Again, T2, a, a Tor relay node, receives this onion. It peels off a layer. It removes the outer header. And it then it decrypts inside. It can because it was encrypted with the key of T2. T2 decrypts this, sends it to who? T3. When we decrypt this packet, we see the de next destination is T3, and we send that onto T3. Can we squeeze it in, maybe at the top?
we have the data E and the destination of this packet is T3. Remember we remove the header, decrypt the insides and we see the destination is T3. Source is still the one who sent it, T2. And that internal of that is encrypted with T3, this part here. So this was This packet is sent to T3. T3 receives it, peels off the outer header. It is the destination, fine. It decrypts because it was encrypted with key known by T3. So it can decrypt and it gets the internal packet and then sends that on to E, another Tor relay or Tor node. What is it? data, destination is E. So just to, to save space, when I write just the letter here, I mean that is the destination. I haven't written the source address. And the data is still encrypted with KE. T3 sends this on to E. E receives and then peels off the outer header decrypts and the data in this case that we're left over with is the original packet which is going to go to the web server. For example, the HTTP GET request. Here we're just using HTTP, so by the data really what we're left with is data we can think it, it's going to go source is E, destination is S, and maybe it's the HTTP packet. HTTP, TCP, and so on. Everyone get that? A lot of steps involved, but each relay node is doing the same thing. What happened at the start is the source computer, you, you generate this packet, this onion, which starts with the, the data that you want to go to the server, say the HTTP request, and the source, oh yeah, it goes to the server, and then you say this needs to go to E. The data is encrypted with a key that E knows. Then all of that is encrypted with a key that T3 knows, and then you add a header saying this needs to go to T3. All of that is encrypted with a key T2 knows. We add a header saying this needs to go to T2, and then encrypted with a key that T1 knows. Add a header saying this needs to go to T1. We send it to T1. And the way that we've set up that onion at the start is such that each relay node can decrypt and see who the next relay node is. T1 decrypts and sees, ah, send it to T2. T2 receives, decrypts, sends it to T3. And T3 to E, and then E eventually gets that HTTP message, which is not encrypted, it's HTTP, sends it to the real web server. The web server sends it back to E, and E does the opposite, sends the onion back to U. So that's the simplest explanation I give how it works. What security features do we get with this? Let's say you intercept the packet at the firewall. What can you see? You're the firewall, you're an ISP, you want to in intercept the user's data. We see the source and destination, what do they identify? 
the source and destination address tell us, tells the firewall, you, is, you are accessing T1. All right, so they don't reveal that you are accessing the server. It does reveal you're accessing some computer in the internet known as T1. So that's some privacy. The firewall doesn't know you're accessing this server S. Can they see the data? No, the data is all encrypted multiple times. So the firewall cannot see your HTTP request. They don't know it's going to the web server S. What if, let's say, you intercepted the packet between T2 and T3? It may not be a single link here. Despite what my picture shows, T2 and T3 may be computers on the other side of the world. But they send to each other. So let's say someone intercepts a packet between T2 and T3. What do they see? Source T2, destination T3, data encrypted. So no one can see it's you talking to the server, and no one can see the data. So we have data confidentiality so far, and no one knows that it's you talking to S. What if you intercept at this router between E and S? What can you see? You can see the data. Between the exit node and the final server, Tor is not used. This is just the normal internet access. So the HTTP message is in the clear. But the source address is E and the destination is S. If you intercept here, you don't know that it is you talking to S. You think it's E talking to S, the exit node. So we have privacy of who is communicating, but not privacy of the data. How do I keep that HTTP message encrypted? HTTPS. So the next slide shows use Tor and HTTPS, and we get almost the same, but in addition, this data going from E to S is encrypted, meaning no one between you and the server can see the data, and no one can identify who is communicating, in particular, U to S. What about the relay nodes, the Tor nodes? Here there were four. Relay nodes T1, T2, T3, and exit node E. What do they see? Does T1 know that it's you contacting the server S? You shake your head, why? Why does it not know? T does T1 know it's U to S? They know it's from you, or they know they've received something from you. So T1 receives a Tor onion from you. That was here. But they don't know that the destination is S. What they do know, it's coming from you, and it's going to go to T2. But anything beyond that, they don't know, because it's all encrypted. So T1 doesn't know that it's you talking to S. In fact, T1 doesn't even know if U was the original source. The way that it works is that maybe what T1 received came from someone before you. So maybe U is just a relay node. So there's no way for T1 to identify that U is the original source or a relay node forwarding for another source. Similar for T2. T2 receives a packet, source is T1, destination T2, and then they send a packet to T3. So T1, T2 knows an onion come from T1 and is going to T3, but they don't know it's going to S, and they don't know it came from U. So the relay nodes only know their next neighbours, the one that it came from and the next one. They don't know the original or the final, and they don't even know if the one that they're sending to is the original or, or is the final. Similar with the others. What about the exit node? It doesn't know you. 
the exit node receives a packet from T3 and sends it to the server. It doesn't know it's you accessing the server. It knows someone is, but it cannot identify the original source. That was using HTTP. This is using HTTPS, where we encrypt that HTTP message and the end result. The firewall cannot read your data. It's all encrypted. They cannot see that it's you talking to the server. Again, those addresses are encrypted. Anyone between you and the server cannot read the data. It's encrypted all the way to the end. And they cannot see the pair of addresses U and S being together, including the relay nodes and the exit nodes. So in fact, we have confidentiality of the data all the way across the path and privacy of who is communicating from everyone. We don't need to trust the relay nodes or exit nodes. With a VPN, we needed to trust the VPN server. With a web proxy, we needed to trust the web proxy. In Tor, we don't need to trust any of those. So we get, with respect to these three solutions, the ultimate security. We've achieved our aim. Questions on Tor? We're going to keep going for five or ten minutes and we'll finish this topic. Everyone uses Tor on a daily basis. Anyone has used Tor recently? It's quite easy. You can install some software on your computer and uh, a similar way with I uh, use the secure shell proxy with my browser. I can set it up to use Tor. I'll show you in a moment. Or in fact, an easier way is you download Firefox, which is configured automatically to use Tor and it immediately uses the network. I'll show you an example. Before I, uh, what do we do? We accessed, this was using the secure shell client. Let's disable that. Let's go to no proxy, back to the original. Try again. What is my IP address? While that's accessing, I'll stop my secure shell session. Slow. OK, back to normal internet access. I access what is my IP address, and it says that Tamasat one. That's normal. Now, I have the Tor client software installed on my laptop. And now, I configure my browser to, instead of sending direct across the internet, send to the Tor client software. And it's quite easy. It's similar to the secure shell proxy, but the Tor client commonly uses port 9050. You can change it, but that's the default port number. What that means, Whatever I do on my browser, my browser sends the data to the Tor software on my computer, and then that software sends it to T1, T2, T3, exit node, and then to the website. And the Tor software on my computer chooses the relays, and there are rules as to which ones to choose and how often to change them. But since the software is sitting and running in the background, let's see if this works. While that's accessing, I will start some interface that shows us the Tor statistics. The software is called ARM. ARM just shows us some st statistics of what we're sending through the Tor network, the uploads and downloads. So it's actually uploading some data, and it's actually downloading some data at some speed now. So. I've accessed that website. Where am I? 
where does what is my IP address think I am? Uh, somewhere in Europe, maybe in, in I don't know, the city, uh, I don't know, uh, former um, Serbia or Croatia or something, I don't know the exact location. Somewhere in Europe, we see from Euronet, and the, the ISP indicates maybe in that region. And the IP address, of course, is not Tamasat. This is the IP address of the exit node. So what I just did, my Tor client sent to one relay, sent to another relay, and then eventually sent to the exit node, and then the exit node sent the request to this website. So the website thinks the person requesting is the exit node, and that will be the address there. So I've hidden who is communicating. The statistics, uh, we can see something about the, the connections. So the relays in my case. I, this is my address, the Tamasad address. The current one, I'm connected to this address. This other, this is a first relay node. And then it's, well, sorry, let's be precise. My address, the first relay node in France, the second relay node in the Netherlands, and the last node, here we just have two relays and then an exit node in SK, what's that? Slovakia. Okay, so this example has two relay nodes and one exit node. So my data went to France, Netherlands, and then the exit node in Slovakia, and then to the what is my IP address website. So that's the the Tor, it's called a Tor circuit in this case. And you can change that so you have a different path. And on a regular basis, your Tor software will change the path. If I connect it again or, or at a later stage, it would have a different path and it would show up as a different IP address here. So let's close with a summary or comparison of these techniques. I think this picture is hard to see on your slides because you only have black and white, but you know it all already. It's just a summary. See what it shows us. On the rows, we have the four techniques. Basic means no extra technique, and we consider either HTTP or HTTPS. And then using a web proxy, either HTTP or HTTPS, a VPN, and Tor. So really three security techniques, web proxy, VPN, Tor, but we have two options, HTTP only or HTTPS. And the columns, the first five show some of the security features. Do we have data secrecy? That is, can anyone read my data? If there's a tick and a green box, it means no, no one can read my data. That's good. We have data secrecy. If it's a red and a cross, it means that's bad for data secrecy. Someone can read my data. So for example, with basic HTTP, we have no data secrecy. With HTTPS, we do. Our data is encrypted. With a proxy, with HTTP, again, no data secrecy, that is, someone can read my data. With HTTPS, we do actually have secrecy, except we must trust the proxy. So I say there's a question mark here, that is, it's not full secrecy because we must trust the proxy in that case. With a VPN, we must trust the VPN server. If it's your server, you, of course, trust your own device, so that's okay. But if it's someone else's VPN server, you must trust that. And with Tor, if we use HTTPS, we have data privacy. The next column, can we bypass the firewall? All three techniques, yes. Without them, no. Right? Because all three techniques, we changed the destination address. 
If the firewall was simply looking at the destination IP address, then we can bypass it with a web proxy, VPN, or Tor. Network privacy and server privacy. Network privacy, can someone between you and the server identify it's you talking to the server? Server privacy, can the server identify it's you talking to the server? That's the difference. Well, they all do. The three techniques provide privacy, but there are some exceptions in some cases. For example, a proxy knows that it's you talking to the server. The VPN server knows it's you talking to the server. So you must trust them. With Tor, there's no one to trust there. We have the, the full network privacy. Do we have privacy from the server? Yes, but be aware the server can still identify you if you log into that website or use other techniques to try and track who you are. So it's not perfect if you use other techniques to, to identify you. We didn't say much about log analysis, but the idea is that you use these techniques today, and then in a month's time, some law enforcement agency or some government comes to your VPN server, your web proxy operator, and can they then look at the logs of those different companies and find out that you contacted the, the website? So that's the idea here. Or what would that agency need to do to find out? Well, if you use a web proxy, they would need to contact the web server and the proxy server and get their permission to see their log files. If you're using a VPN, you must, they must contact the VPN operator. With Tor, it's quite hard for some other agency to try and find out, based upon the past access, what happened. The last three are not security, but cost, which one's cheapest, which one's easiest to use, and which one performs the best. Basically, Tor is free. The other two may be free or maybe you pay per month. All right, they're different options. Which one's easy to use? With a web proxy, you simply use your browser. Pretty much anyone can do that. With a VPN, you need to set up some software or set up some configuration on your operating system. And with Tor, you need to install some software. With performance, Tor is generally the worst because you go via multiple different nodes. Okay, it's not just one VPN server to send via, but multiple relays and an exit node. So the performance can be much worse than the others. And the others, the performance depends upon where the servers are. But generally, Tor is worse than the others. None of them, none of the techniques uh, will give you the best performance. Which one's best? Tor unless you want good performance, then maybe you need to go back to a VPN. Unless you don't want to pay money, then maybe you go back to a free web proxy. Unless you don't trust that web proxy server, then, so there's no one best solution. You need to consider your requirements. But generally, the speed of Tor is improving, so it's now considered one of the better options uh, if you're prepared to install the software and sacrifice a little bit of performance. This slide we will not go through talks about the different tunneling protocols. We demonstrated Secure Shell, but there are others. I'll let you explore them and, and find out how about how those different tunneling protocols compare uh, 